So like I said, we will start with uh, a demo on data visualization with M&E uh, by Britta Wessner. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. <laughs> Um, so Britta uh, is uh, focusing on predictive processes in the visual system using MEG methods and she works at the Donner's Institute in Nijmegen. Uh, she's uh, interested in MEG decoding in general, um, MEG EEG source reconstruction techniques um, and she's also core develop developer of the MEG EEG data analysis toolbox uh, ME Python. Um, and in this demo she will uh, tell you more about it. So please go ahead. The floor is yours. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me and this very kind introduction. I will just uh, get ready now sharing my screen. So just a second. Um, as usual on Zoom, I hope you can see, see my screen now. It would be great if someone could confirm. Yeah, awesome. We can see. Um, so yes, I would like to talk to you uh, today about data visualization with m and &E Python. And I just got introduced so I can kind of spare this slide. Maybe quickly I will go over it anyway. So I'm a postdoc in the Predictive Brain Lab with Flores de Lange now. Uh, I arrived at the Donners, as you can see here, in the middle of Corona times, um, but still making the best out of it. I'm focusing on visual predictive processing um, with MEG, mostly looking at oscillatory activity. Um, I am also working more on the methods side on social construction techniques and MEG decoding, as mentioned before. And I'm a core developer of m &E Python, and that's why I'm here today to talk to you guys. So a very brief overview of what I will um, share with you today. I first want to, since it is an MR conference after all, I first want to briefly talk about some challenges when visualiza uh, visualizing MEG and EEG data. Um, I will then introduce m &E Python, the toolbox to you, and then I will dare to do a live demo of um, some visualization features in m &E Python. Fingers crossed that everything will work there. Uh, and then I just want to wrap up with uh, telling you how to get started with m and &E Python, either as a user or maybe even as a contributor. So MEG and EEG measure uh, the neuronal activity um, in terms of either magnetic fields for MEG or electric potentials for EEG. And as you can see in this uh, little plot here that I just took out of one of my recent um, papers, you can see that MEG data is high dimensional. Uh, in this case, I plotted the spatial extent of MEG activity over different time points on the x-axis and different frequency bands on the y-axis. So we usually have a very high temporal resolution in our data usually at the scale of one millisecond or even above that. Um, we have, depending on the system, between 200 and 400 sensors recording that highly resolved temporal um, activity, uh, each of them. And if we then, as you can see here, reconstruct where this activity most likely came from in source space, we get to thousands of source points where we estimate activity at. And then if we want to look not only at the time extent, but also the frequency content of our data, we can add many different frequency bands. So in this example here, I actually averaged a lot as well in time as also frequency space, but still just to give you an idea, I had, it's not all plotted here, four different time bins, five different frequency bands, and roughly 20,000 source points that I estimated. So you get an idea of that can explode uh, quickly. And then you have to kind of figure out how to find a good way to visualize this to make sense of the data. For a lot of my work, I use m and &E Python, which is an open source software package to not only visualize MEG data, but also process it. Um, just as a brief introduction, m and &E Python uses the Python ecosystem, 
and has between 30 and 10 years of development behind it, depending on how you count. m and &E Python was built on m and &E c uh, which was um, made by Matti Hemmelainen, who is uh, a professor in Boston, and was then later, just 10 years ago, translated into m and &E Python, uh, into Python uh, with m and &E Python by Alexandre Gramfort, who started um, this whole uh, m and &E Python ecosystem. Uh, at the moment, we have two maintainers of the toolbox, that's Alex and also Eric Larson, and over 200 contributors over the last 10 years. So we are quite a um, active community. I just screenshotted here from GitHub the activity over the last month. You can see that we have 44 contributors in the last month that pushed over 150 commits. But those numbers don't tell you that much. I think what's maybe even more important is the community behind it. And here is just one glimpse into our core development group um, of those people who could made it to our in-person coding sprint 2019 in Paris. And I just want to point out again, this is uh, Alex Gramford here on the left. And uh, four to the right, this is Eric Larson, who now also does an incredible amount of work for this toolbox. And on the bottom here, you can also see that we have a lot of different institutions all around the world contributing a lot of work, but some of them also grant money to keeping m and &E Python up and running and to improving the toolbox. So what can you do with m and &E Python? Uh, and to give you just a glimpse into the many, many things that we support and that you can do with our toolbox, I want to give you a short slideshow of some of the possibilities focusing on the visualization of them. So you can do pre-processing of your MEG or EEG data. We also support ECOC data as well as um, FNIRS data. Um, and here is one example, apart from normal um, filtering and the like, you can also do more exotic things like denoising with XDAWN. You might then want to do evoked analysis to get evoked fields or event-related potentials, and you can uh, cut those epochs, get to the evoked part, and then plot it, for example, here comparing um, different conditions of evoked fields with each other. You can do time frequency analysis. Here, just a glimpse into computing the power of your data over different frequency bands on the y-axis or the intertribe coherence, which gives you an idea of time-locked activity, again, over different frequency bands and time. You can do source reconstruction, meaning you can estimate from the data that you, uh, that you recorded somewhere around the head with your sensors, whether it's EEG channels or MEG um, channels. You can estimate where this activity most likely arose in the brain with different um, algorithms. We, for example, support m and &E which is the name giver for m and &E Python that stands for minimum norm estimate or different kinds of beamformers as well as dipole fitting. And then once you are in source space, you can compute the connectivity between different brain areas for a specific task. And then, of course, we also support a lot of statistics and also decoding um, algorithms with the toolbox. We also have a very good integration towards scikit-learn, the decoding toolbox. And here is one example, the decoding of MEG activity across time uh, to see how a signal or a component of a signal generalizes on a time trajectory. So most of our visualizations rely on Matplotlib um, and PyVista. 
uh, PyVista supports our 3D rendering of brains. Um, we also support interactive plots, and both of that actually also in Jupyter Notebooks. And I thought that we uh, already had a Jupyter Notebook experience this morning. Um, I want to try and do a live demo with you to show you some of those features in a more hopefully graspable way. The code can be obtained on GitHub. Um, I don't think we have the time to really do this together, but if you're interested into redoing some of the steps afterwards, the code is on my um, GitHub repository. So let me just switch to that. So we will now attempt to do a very quick run through of MEG data analysis starting with the raw data and ending with a source reconstruction to estimate where this activity came from in the brain. Um, just if someone wasn't here this morning or hasn't heard of it before, a Jupyter Notebook is basically a integration of a text document, as you can see here, and live code that you can still execute from this notebook. So to start, we just import matplotlib and MNE. And I will just um, set the warning level so that we don't get buried into a lot of uh, MNE Python's verbosity. And now it's time to load our raw data. And the nice thing about MNE Python is that it comes with access to many public data sets that you can just load from within M&E, and if it doesn't exist yet, it will just download it to your disk automatically from the Open Science Framework. The data set that we are using here is a data set that had auditory and visual um, cues presented to the participants, either in their left or, visual, um, left or right visual uh, field or the left or right ear. So we have loaded those uh, raw data now. I just made a copy for plotting because we're gonna mess with the data. Um, and with just this plot command, we can now plot the raw data. It takes some time to load it all up, but here it is. Um, and now you can just scroll through this to look at all of your data. On the left hand, you can see the different channel numbers. You can see that we have MEG channels here. And on the right side, you can see a bar with different colors that gives you an orientation where in the data set you are, because we have different channel types. We have in light blue, MEG gradiometers. In dark blue, MEG magnetometers, because that MEG system has both channel types. And then we also have EEG data as well as EOG data and uh, the stimulus channels. So what you can do now when you are just scrolling through your data, um, you can see there is one channel already grayed out that was already detected as bad, but you could say, okay, I don't like this channel here and neither do I like this one. I want to get rid of them. And you just click them and they will be grayed out and remembered as bad. Now you could also say, well, I don't like what I see here and I want to mark this as an annotation for later. So you can just interactively mark those heartbeats in your data and give it an annotation. In this case, I just called it test. So if we now close this and we look at the info that we have with the raw object, you can see here that we marked several channels as bad channels in our interactive view. And if we look at the annotations, annotations that are associated with this raw object, you can see that we marked four segments as bad test. Now we can go on and use the triggers that were sent to the acquisition system when we had our experiment set up to cut the data into epochs, 
around those triggers. And we will just use the left ear auditory stimuli here with the event code one. And then we can average over all those events to get an so-called evoked that will average out the noise of all the different epochs that we have in the data. I think it's around 180, if I remember correctly, that, will, that we will just average together here. And now, of course, we would like to know what that looks like, and we can just plot our evoked data. So let me walk you through this. Here at the time point zero on the x-axis, our stimulus was presented to the, left uh, to the left ear, an auditory stimulus. And you can see that roughly, let's say 75 milliseconds after that happened, something happens in the brain in those pink and orange channels. You can see here in that little inset where they belong to. And then later something happens apparently on the other side. You can also see that we have some of the topo plots um, as a view of where in which channels things happen to this time point on top of this uh, time series. But maybe we want to get an even better grip of what's, of what's happening in this topographic overview. And for that, we can just use IPython uh, magic using the IPy widgets and plot an interactive topo plot where we can now scroll through time and click around and see what's happening at different time points. For example, before anything was presented or around 100 milliseconds where we have a lot of activity. So this might already give us an idea where things come from in the brain. You can see the ears here and the nose on the top, but I usually want to know a bit more precisely where things arouse in the brain. And for that, we have several ways for MEG and EEG data, how to estimate that. And one way is a so-called beamformer that will estimate um, where this activity comes from. For this to work, we need a mathematical model that helps us um, ar arrive to that solution that's called the forward model. And that is the one thing that I will just load from this key. I, that's pre-computed because that computation would take a while. But once we have that, we can compute our so-called beamformer spatial filter and apply it to our evoked data. And now we can visualize activity and I'm gonna visualize the activity on the surface of the brain. So you can see the right hemisphere surface here, it's inflated, so the, um, that's, that's why it looks a bit like a balloon. We can turn it. We can see there is one marker here, that's our maximum activity. And we can see the corresponding time course of this activity down here. If we want to compare that, we can set another marker, for example, here, and compare the activity between those two points. We can also say, oh, we'd rather want to know what happens at this point, at roughly 50 milliseconds. And the activity up here will now mirror what is happening at 50 milliseconds. Or we can just sit back, relax, and see this activity unfold in front of us as a movie. So far, not much is happening, which makes sense because the stimulus is not even presented. Now we present the stimulus. And now we can already see first activity coming in. Those movies are also um, savable to disk. So you could, for example, uh, use them as a supplement for a paper publication. All 
Okay, let me find back to my slides. Uh, Britta, in the meantime, there is a question in the chat. Yes, of course, go ahead. Um, they say, where are the stimulus points? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Um, so during the experiment, uh, the- In the movie. <laughs> oh, in the, in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Let's I'm see. no MG expert, so uh, yeah, that's so all. I'm gonna there. just open this again. So here is zero milliseconds, and this is when the stimulus was presented. And we are just looking at the activity that we selected in the beginning, which was the uh, auditory left ear stimulation. So at zero milliseconds, a beep was presented to the left ear of our participant. And what we see here is the averaged activity over all roughly 180 trials where this happened, all overlaid and averaged with each other. And then source we constructed to source space. And this is, this is the activity that corresponds to the stimulus presentation here around zero. And then, as I said before, roughly 70 milliseconds later, we can see activity in auditory cortex um, due to the stimulation. Does that make it clear? Uh, I think so. Okay, thanks, yes. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> okay. Let's just, there we go. Okay, so maybe some of you, I hope, are now excited about what you can do with ME Python and are maybe thinking about revamping their old EEG data set that they still have on their hard drive and are asking themselves, well, how do I get started? Um, the best pointer I can give you is our ME.tools homepage where you can find install information on how to install ME Python um, via a Conda environment on your computer, but also a lot of tutorials as well as shorter examples um, that can show you how to get started with anything I have shown you today. So all the pictures I showed you in my gallery were actually pictures from tutorials and examples that exist in the uh, ME Python homepage. And the short script that I used for my live demo is a shortened version of our tutorial on beamforming um, as well available here. We also have a discourse um, platform where you can go and ask questions as well as a mailing list. And we have a Discord server uh, that's all linked, by the way, on the homepage, where you can hang out and ask questions. And every two weeks on Fridays, we have office hours there where you can go and ask your questions to the m and &E Python community that will be online for those office hours. And to close my presentation, I want to give a, uh, I want to use this platform to give you a message that is very important to me. And that is for all those out there who are thinking about contributing either to ME Python or to any other open source package, but haven't quite found the courage to do so yet. One thing I often get asked from colleagues who are thinking about contributing is, oh, but I don't think I can do anything for you because I don't have a computer science background. And I just want to use this opportunity to state that you do not have to have a computer science background for open source. You have to be enthusiastic about what you want to implement and you have to be eager to learn a thing or two along the way, but you do not have to bring a CV for that. And just to maybe make that point a bit uh, clearer or, or bring a bit more flash around it, I want to 
briefly share my story, how I got into open source with Emily Python. I studied psychology and not computer science. Uh, I only learned coding at university and only during my PhD, I really learned coding uh, beyond the little hello world examples and some statistics. Uh, and then towards the end of my PhD, I ended up doing a Google Summer of Code program, a three month coding internship with m and &E Python. And that is where I got started with the open source community. What I did there was revamping and rewriting a lot of the Beamformer module in m and &E Python. And that is what I have been contributing ever, uh, to ever since. And since roughly 2019, I'm also now a core developer for m and &E. And then as a woman, I also would like to say that I believe in diversity and inclusion and m and &E Python does too. Uh, we do believe that if we have a diverse coder contributor base, our toolbox will be better as any uh, product can be better, whether that's a science paper or an open source toolbox. Just last week, we had a coding sprint for new contributors to bring them up to speed. And it was great to see that we had a diverse crowd attending there. So maybe that just as a Closing word from me, I hope we can all work together to make open source and neuroscience more diverse and inclusive. With that, I want to thank you for your attention and I want to thank all the many, many contributors to m and &E Python uh, that I have listed here. And of course, I'm happy to answer any questions. Wow, that was a really nice talk. <laughs> thank you. Yes, I'm like a non-EEG expert and it's really easy to follow along and to see all the examples and I think a lot of people think the same, so I don't know if there were any questions. I saw a question in Discord um, from my colleague Daniel, so if you want to ask it here, go ahead. Um, yeah, should I stop sharing my, maybe it's better if I stop sharing for that, then we can see each other. Yeah, then maybe we can see all. Um, I see in chat, is there an easy way to project sources um, or vertices uh, that very pre-processed? Um, uh, Ah, okay. Yes. So I think the question, I just read it. If I understand the question correctly, it is, whether you can, if you have a source reconstruction from another toolbox, whether you can import that to m and &E Python, for example, for visualization. Uh, the answer to that is a bit mixed. Uh, and the reason for that is that for MEG or EEG data, we do not have all our data in the same space. You have the MRI that you will use for your source reconstruction that comes from the MRI scanner in what we call MRI space. And you have the, let's say, MEG data that comes from your MEG scanner in MEG headspace. And you need to get those two spaces together to be able, you can imagine that you have to know where the sensors were relative to your brain to do a source reconstruction. And that co-registration step can be done quite differently in different toolboxes, which then means that the representation of MRI to the data, et cetera, can also be um, a bit different. For example, whether you import everything to MRI space or you import everything to MEG space. And those objects then might not line up in the different coordinate systems between the different toolboxes. And that is one major obstacle you could run into if you want to import already source reconstructed data from any one MEG toolbox to any other MEG toolbox. So uh, it is possible, I have done it before between FieldTrip and m and &E Python, but it involved a bit of hacking. <laughs> 
I don't know if there are any other questions. Like for me, it's difficult to come up with a question because like I'm not really super familiar with EG. Maybe Stain has like more experience with it. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I, well, I, uh, I, I do have a question. So first of all, Britta, I want to compliment you on your uh, presentation. Um, it's, a, yeah, it's a very w clear way of presenting it. Uh, it was uh, very clear to follow. So thank you very much for that. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> so that being said, um, for example, I come from a, um, uh, from a more MRI and AI uh, back, well, background, not, but uh, I'm involved in uh, more MRI and AI research. Now, of course, I, I also do tend to get uh, very excited about these um, about these toolboxes. And for example, if you're a person that I, that is um, that likely has some kind of other uh, skills and that is not an optimal fit for MME, how do you think that we can still indeed contribute to this? Because it's very nice for people, I guess, to to get into uh, that open science community. I also feel that by being involved in open MR. Um, and so that could be, yeah, that's just a question how you could contribute there. Yeah, so um, usually we like uh, our contributors to have some neuroscience background. Um, it's not an exclusion criteria by any means, but I think the experience is that that makes it easier to, to understand the problems we are trying to solve. And for that, I'm not sure if it would really be a disadvantage in big quotation marks if you have MR experience, but not so much EEG or MEG experience. A lot of the things that we do, for example, in the visualization modules is trying to plot data. And then I think whether that's MRI data or MEG data is probably not that big of a difference. Um, from the learning curve, I would say that learning how the objects that we work with, like the raw data or the epochs, the evokes, etc., how they are organized, that is pretty fast to understand. Um, then it's more about how do we solve things so that they work for the user, but also are still uh, feasible in terms of, of coding and how long it takes to draw up the uh, visualization, etc. So if you are um, enthusiastic about this, I would say just come along on GitHub, see what open issues we have. And if there's anything that you think that you could tackle, just, just try it. Um, come to Discord and chat to some people or contact people through the mailing list. Uh, we are very open and always happy if people are enthusiastic about trying to figure something out. Okay, great, thank you so much. Yeah, indeed, it, it's um, part of the discussion, I guess, that we have throughout the, the conference of how, how do we reduce that threshold for people to engage in this. Uh, we have a lot of uh, discussions on this, so uh, this, this really helps. Thank you so much, Greta. I don't know if there are any other questions. Like, I like the two last questions. It was really nice to hear your opinion and vision on it. Um, otherwise, I would say that that we can like start the break a bit earlier and then we are like refreshed for Stefan's talk like later on data um, on um, what was it again on Dash on Dash and uh, Plotly uh, so again thank you very much for your very nice talk and very and, and the demo as well very nice you're uh, welcome I'm also gonna be around on discord so if someone wants to chat to me personally has a question uh, feel free to contact me there